Let's pray. Father, we pray that you speak to every heart now, and we pray that your word will be readily applied by your spirit in every one of our hearts. And we pray that you will cleanse us completely so that every form of uncleanness will not be found in our lives. Prepare us as we prayed before, Lord, for a better, greater service. In Jesus' name we pray. From Matthew chapter 12. Verse 34, we are considering the spirit behind the tongue. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The Lord Jesus Christ had been confronted by some people, and this was not the first time that they will show the state of their heart by the utterance of their mouth. And Jesus at this time warned them of the great impardonable sin. As he warned them of this terrible sin, which comes out by the utterance of the mouth, he now showed them that this is the case with them and with anyone because of the condition of the spirit, of the heart, of the mind. Earlier they had opened their mouth to comment on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew, heaven knew, God knew, the angels knew, even Satan knew that the power that Jesus manifested was the real power of God. But these people, as they surveyed and examined and evaluated the work of Jesus Christ, altered their own verdict or their own conclusion that everything that Jesus did, he did by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. He knew their thoughts. He knew their motive. He knew why they said what they said. Then he set them right. He corrected them. He said, how could that be? But at the end of the whole thing, he warned them against the unpardonable sin. And then in verse 34, he says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I want you to notice this fearful thing that the unpardonable sin is connected with the utterance of the mouth. You watch a man that brings his mouth under control. He may have a lot of weaknesses. He may have a lot of shortcomings. But those shortcomings will be short of the unpardonable sin. But watch a man who might be having some good qualities of character and life in any other area, but the only problem he has is that whenever he looks or surveys something, he is quick at passing comments. He is quick at making judgment. He is quick at expressing his own mind as to what he feels about the church, the ministry, the preacher, and other people. He is quick at evaluating that what is going on is either by God or not by God according to his own judgment. That man is not far from the unpardonable sin. You see, the quiet man will not commit the unpardonable sin. 
The one that fears and keeps his mouth short will not commit the unpardonable sin. It is the man or the woman that is very, very quick in judging that dooms himself or brings himself under this terrible thing. And eventually Jesus told them, he said, Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. This terrible sin that cannot be pardoned is connected with whosoever speaketh. It is a sin of utterance. It is by what people say from their mouth. And then that means that in the final analysis, when you consider what will debar a man from getting the grace of God, or what will hinder him from getting the grace of God, his mouth plays a major role. And then in verse 33, either make the tree good or his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit O generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh here Jesus Christ connected the tongue with the heart, the speech with the spirit, and the message with the mind. That what comes out on the external is a revelation of what is hidden deep within the heart or the spirit. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Well then, as we hear words that are spoken day by day, words of lie, words of pride, words of anger, words of division, words of rebellion, all these words that are spoken, the people that say them sometimes will say they don't have any bad motive, they do not have any bad objective, they do not mean anything seriously wrong. They are just expressing something naturally normal to them. But Jesus said it's more than just an innocent use of vocabulary. It is a revelation of the state of the mind that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so as you see the words you speak out, there is a spirit behind the words you speak. There is a spirit, a moving force behind the word that you are speaking. And Jesus said this to the people. He said, for example, to James and John, after they had seen Samaria, and Samaria had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ because he wanted to pass by that way, but he refused him. And then James and John uttered some words. They said, Lord, give us the permission that we may call down fire upon them as Elijah did. You know the answer of Jesus? He said, you do not know of what spirit you are of. That is, that utterance, a destructive utterance, an utterance of wanting to do harm and havoc to other people, it was motivated by a spirit. Do you remember that after Judas Iscariot had made covenant with the people that he wanted to sell Jesus Christ to their hands, he came and then he received the soap, he received the meal, and then the Bible says, Satan entered into him. After Satan entered into him, Jesus said, What thou doest, do quickly. You need to finalize your covenant. You need to make some utterances to those Pharisees. What you do, do quickly. After Satan had entered, 
You see, the words of betrayal are motivated by a spirit. Do you remember that when the evil spirit entered into Saul, he saw that David was playing the harp, and then he threw a javelin, and that young man escaped. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 20, there is no time to turn to that now, he asked Jonathan, he said, where is David? So Jonathan said, he asked permission from me that he will go and attend to something in his family, and I gave him permission. And in a verse that is closely connected with the evil spirit that had entered into him, he opened up and he fired on. He said, thou son of a perverse woman, have you not chosen David to thy hurt? As long as that David remains alive, you cannot train. Go and bring him here, he must die. There was a spirit behind it. You see, the words of betrayal, the words of destruction, the words of abusive language, the words of envy, the words of jealousy, the words of enmity that will speak against other people, there is a spirit behind it. And that spirit, when it affects your own mind, affects your own heart, affects your own human spirit, then your tongue runs loose, out of control. You cannot control that tongue because of the spirit that is moving or driving or motivating your tongue to speak. That's why I've titled the message, The Spirit Behind the Tongue. It's not just that you say, well, that is how I just speak. No, that's the type of spirit that lives in you. It's a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. That's what we're told in Ephesians. It says, the spirit will work according to the course of this life. According to the people that were still rebellious. And it says, that spirit now is still working in the children of disobedience. So it is not just ordinary word. It is something motivated by the evil spirit, by Satan himself. That is why those who yield themselves to that spirit and they yield their tongues to that spirit, death will be very, very near them because the captain of the spirit, the master of that spirit, motivating their tongue is the destroyer, the thief, and the killer. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And as you have seen, the major problem that people have from the time they have been unregenerate, even to the time they have become saved, the major problem we have is the problem of the tongue and you see it is not because we cannot be totally saved and totally born again it is because that evil spirit is very powerful its motivating force is very very powerful and so at your unsuspected moment when that spirit begins to aggravate and you know it is aggravating you because you just come to the point where you cannot hold yourself. Even when you have said, I will not speak, I will not talk, I will not comment, I will not lie again. If I speak out, they will see that I am envious and jealous. If I speak out, they will see that I am angry and boisterous. Because of that, I am not going to talk, I'm going to keep quiet. You keep quiet for a particular period. Then that spirit begins to rage within. He becomes turbulent. He becomes nervous. And it begins to exercise you from within. And uh, you say, I said I will not talk before, but now I don't know what has come upon me. Well, you should know. It's a spirit within. And it's beyond just your human spirit. That your human spirit has got aid, help from, uh, from outside. And it is from outside the kingdom of God and from outside of you. 
and then he begins to talk from within you and you say a lot of things you get to a point you realize that what you are saying they are not all correct but the wind is blowing you on and the spirit accelerates your speech and you keep on you know that some of those words are just lies but there's nothing you can do about it you keep on saying them you know that some of these words are just words of jealousy they are just outright envy but you keep on saying them you see that some of those words you are speaking they are now real angry words but there's nothing you can do about it you just go on you are going down a slope and the wind is blowing in that direction and the spirit is pushing in that direction you talk faster you talk nervously and after you have read that person you are talking about and you have read yourself as well when there is no more no more thing to say then for a moment you keep quiet but you find yourself in the ditch you have had an accident spiritually you have gone you have died your real spirit now your human spirit that had been silenced before when that other spirit was pushing you it becomes so discouraged you say what am i going to do look at all these things i've spoken down and they are not all correct and some of these things are just absolute exaggeration some of these things are outright lies some of these things have just been motivated because of the jealousy you have against that brother some of these things have been motivated because of your pride that has been hurt but you have spoken them and the spirit behind you will not leave you alone will not constrain you or constrain, constrain you until you say everything now you begin to regret and then you go back and the lord says we can't settle it privately because the tree you have cut down has affected many crops so if we settle it privately here how about the crops you have damaged by the tree you cut down go to the owner of the crop and settle it that means a lot of things you have done has destroyed the fruit of other people's lives the fruit of other people's ministries the tree you cut down by your tongue by your sharp sword has already affected the lives of other people in a major unforgettable manner and that's why the lord cannot settle that privately with you and just say well i'll settle it with god you can never if you hide it and you say you will settle it with god eventually that thing will become unpardonable sin you see it will not be pardoned until you go to the owner of those crops that your tree you fell down destroy the crops their lives have been destroyed their families have been destroyed you have lied against them and after you have destroyed them without settling all those things you have said with your mouth god cannot cover that thing up that is why it is so serious. The man that holds his tongue is the wisest man on the face of the earth. The man that says, I just will not say anything. Because if I don't say anything, I don't increase the sin. Even if I've done something wrong before. Rather than covering it up, rather than lying, rather than uttering, uttering some things that will get me more into trouble that I will not be going one by one to the people I destroyed their cross by the tree that fell down, I rather will not say anything. I feel that that man is proud, but I may be wrong, and should in case I'm wrong, I better not say anything. If he is proud, let the Lord judge him. I feel that that man, maybe, maybe he has ulterior motive, I better not say it. Because if I do, that thing can become a heavy load on me. You see, once you have evaluated somebody and you have judged already, if it were just in your mind and you didn't tell anybody anything, you didn't destroy anybody by in any way with your tongue, you can easily go back to God when you realize it and say, Lord, it was in my mind, but you know, I didn't speak out. You know, I didn't hurt anybody. You know, I was, you know, it was a great temptation. Lord, cleanse me and you can be cleansed there and go on your way to heaven. But once, look at us as we're here now. And we don't know everybody and you just by chance meet somebody oh how are you you are from such and such a state i see that on the card that you have on your chest there 
Uh, how about your state? I've been hearing some bad, bad stories about your state. I hear that there's one Mr. something in your state, in one of your churches there, going up and down and destroying that your church. What type of church do you people have? I've had a lot. I've never known that place. I've never been there. I've had a lot. You don't know this man that you are talking to. You just met him right there. And then you talked a lot and talked a lot, crucified some people, assassinated some people, beheaded some people, damaged some people, broke some, the legs of some people, plucked out the eyes of some other people, deafened other people. While you are there, you don't even know the, man, the people you are talking about. It just caused a lot of havoc. And then you say, ah, the program is going on. Let us, let us go. And then you came for the program. Then after you have come for the program, the Lord begins to convict you. All the broke, all the legs are broken with your tongue. All the eyes you are blinded with your tongue. All the ears you are deafened with your tongue. All the houses you are pulled down with your tongue. You say, oh Lord, I am sorry. Now, the person you are just talking to from another state, you didn't even know the person. You just met the person there. What are you going to do now? Your life is complicated. To settle that problem is going to take special grace. There is ordinary grace for the sinners that are coming in. It's going to take special grace. When I've stolen five naira from somebody, I know the person. I go to restore it. My mind is clear. What am I going to do that I don't know the fellow? I know that the fellow was sitting down there and just, you know, picked up the five naira, went away, and were from various, various places. What am I going to do now? You complicate your life by just the things that you say by the careless utterances, by the angry words, by not being very careful at an unsuspected moment, instead of saying, I have enough load to carry already. I have enough problems to bear already. As I came to this workers' retreat, I had a lot I wanted to pray about. I will not complicate my life by comment on this, comment on that, talk about that sister, talk about that brother, so that my life will not be complicated. Friends, heaven is high. And the standard to get to heaven is very, very high. You see people that do not know heaven, and they do not know the way to heaven, they take the Christian life just casually. They take it so casual that they think that when I am ready, I will come to seek the face of the Lord. I about if you are ready and God is not ready. Oh, you say, anytime I like, I can go back to God. He will forgive me. What if you are ready and God is not ready? Seek the Lord while he may be found. There is a time he cannot be found. There is a time he will not be available. If you so complicate your life by the words you speak out, if you so complicate your life by the utterances you make, you can close the door of heaven to yourself forever. That is why a wise child of God who says, I know in whom I have believed. And the reason I came into the kingdom of God is because I want to get to heaven. And I know there is a spirit behind me. There is a devil behind me. Who doesn't want me to get to heaven? And the easiest way he will do it is not going to move my legs and get me to the prostitute's house. He knows that that is not possible now. It's not going to move my legs and go to the side of the road and begin to waylay people and stop them from in their cars and take their money from them. He knows that that will be far-fetched, that I cannot do that now. He knows that he's not going to get me to go uh, to somebody's house in the night and break his house and go and take his property. He knows he cannot do that now, but he knows the easiest way is to tie a rope on your tongue and pull you by your tongue into the pit of hell. That's the easiest way for him. And there are people that they just pull out, open their mouth, stretch out their tongue, and they say, devil, you can hook me by the tongue. That is where you can get me. You cannot get me other places, but if you want to hook me by the tongue, they just pull out their tongue and they say, here is my tongue, and the devil hooks them. How many people have been hooked like that with their tongue? And the devil is just driving them by the tongue. Their hands may not steal. Their body may not commit adultery, and they may not commit sin with all the other parts of their body but the tongue. And if you are hooked tonight, the only thing I can tell you is that you will need a lot of prayer. Five minutes prayer may not be able to break that yoke and cut that hook. 
may not be able to adjust everything that has been damaged with your tongue, it, will t it may take more than five minutes. It will take real serious praying. In fact, that is what determines the person that wants to get to heaven. The person that is saying, Lord, my slate is dirty. My life is dirty. Everything has been complicated because of my tongue. But now, I will follow after you. And I will correct everything that has to be corrected. Now let me show you that sometimes when we speak with our tongue, we may feel we are very, very sure of what we are saying. And that is the dangerous thing. You see, when you are saying something and you know that this thing is wrong, it may not be difficult to repent. But when you are saying something and you are so sure about what you are saying, you are so definite about what you are saying, and yet, this thing you are saying will take heaven away from your hand. This thing you are saying will cut you away completely from the kingdom of God, and yet you are so sure that what you are saying is correct. And yet, it is the thing that will debar you from getting to heaven or having the favor of God. What will you do? Turn with me to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42 from verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and builded the Shuhite, and so far the Neamathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. And the Lord also accepted Job. What happened here is that Job had some problems that he himself didn't understand. His wife didn't understand. His neighbors didn't understand. He had three friends. Those three friends were knowledgeable. In those early days, it was very, very rare to find people that manifested the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight, the depth of experience of those three friends. Reading their utterances, they were obviously high class educated people. Not just secular education, they appear to have got the knowledge of God. They appear to have got pure doctrine in those days. And because they were so sure about their level of knowledge, they came to talk to Job about his problem. Job was in the minority. They were in the majority. You know, sometimes that's what gives us assurance. We think the person we are talking against is in the minority. We think that this fellow we are talking against, he doesn't have many people on his side. He must be wrong and you are in the majority. There are a lot of people that say exactly what you are saying. And because you feel that you have the backing of the majority supporting you, you think you are right. That's what they felt. Not only that, they appealed to history, ancient history. They appealed to contemporary times. You see, when you can talk, and you can be very, very logical, and you can appeal to ancient history, and you can appeal to the little, little knowledge you have gathered. You say, eh, this is how Methodist Church started. This is how um, CAC Church started. This is how Anglican Church started. Because you have a little history on the, on the tip of your tongue, you think you must be right in what you are saying. That after all, I am sure about what I am saying. I'm appealing to history. And that's the downfall of many people. Not only that, because they could see very clearly that Job was in a problem. And therefore they felt, apart from the history we're appealing to, 
apart from all the other things we are saying, because of the knowledge, deep knowledge you will have, Job, you must be wrong. Let's see their words and see how sure they were in what they were saying. Job chapter 4, from verse 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If we are said to commune with thee, will thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? That's the problem. They say, I cannot but talk. If other people are not talking, who can withhold himself from speaking? There is a spirit pushing you. There is a spirit that is driving you. And you see there are people that go from house to house. There are people that go from one brother to the other brother to another sister to another sister. They have nothing else to talk about. They are talking about Job. Do you know the problem in our pastor's life? Do you know that since they got married, they didn't have this and that? Well, they say they are pastors. They thought that because when they say they know the will of God, nobody can challenge them. The general overseer in Lagos will just say, okay, you know the will of God, you are a pastor, okay, go, go ahead. But you see what problem they have in their family now. We knew that that thing was not the will of God before. You see that now? You will pay for your utterance. You will pay for the words you are speaking. They tell us, you see that woman now, she got pregnant. And uh, after she got pregnant, you see now, nine months have gone, ten months gone, eleven months gone, twelve months gone. Do you see that she, is not, she has not delivered now? I said so before. They didn't believe me. Well, they won't believe me because I'm not a zonal leader. They won't believe me because I'm not an area leader. I said that woman had familiar spirit. And that woman, you, you will see, she will never deliver that uh, baby. Well, they say they have faith, they, have, they can pray, they say that they can manifest, but let them manifest. You see, we have been counting months for that woman now. I know that that person has familiar spirit. On the second day of your utterance, the woman delivers. What are you going to do now? You say she will never deliver, she has familiar spirit, she has evil spirit. And that that is the reason why she has not delivered. Second day after you spoke, now the child comes out. What do you do? You'll pay for it. People get married, and after they have got married, we're watching them. One year, no child. Two years, no child. Three years, no child. We go all about. We say, well, how about you? You are planning marriage. You better come and we counsel you. You see all those people? They won't come to us for counseling. They think it's only state overseer that can counsel. They think state overseer's monopoly of Holy Ghost. They think it's only the pastor that can counsel. They won't come to us. They will, they will commonize us, belittle us. But three years now, they didn't have any child. It was not the will of God, their marriage. We knew it. We knew it. And yet, they won't allow us to talk. Even when they make announcement, if any person or group of people find that there is nothing wrong, we should not join these people together. They just make an, if we talk, they won't listen to us. But you see now, that thing is not the will of God. They have not got any child. And after you have said the thing is not the will of God because they didn't have any child, after that they had one child, two children, three children, four children. What are you going to do now? Because you said that thing was not the will of God because they didn't have any child. Now they have four children. Maybe you spoke that thing seven years ago, before they had any child at all. Now they have seven children. How will you clean up your slate? You see how you complicate your life? You see how you get involved in things that is not your concern, that will take you to hell, fire, direct, expressway? So these people, they came, and they were talking to Job. And it wasn't necessary. Nobody forced them to talk, except the spirit behind their tongue. They said, if we commune with thee, without be grieved, who can withhold himself from speaking? In verse 3, behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened weak hands. The words, thy words have upholding him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened feeble knees. But now it is come upon thee, and thou faintest, it touches thee, and thou art in trouble. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, the uprightness of thy ways? Remember, I pray thee, this is history now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? That man was sure of what he was saying. And yet his words were his condemnation. 
He was sure, but he was wrong. Look at his certainty, how sure he was. Chapter 5, he was the same person that kept on talking. Chapter 5, verse 27, Lo this, we have searched it, so it is. Hear it and know it for thy good. You see how sure the man was? And yet at the end of the whole conversation, God called him and said, Man, you are so sure. You said, Lo, we have searched it. It is so. Know it for thy good. My wrath is against you for your utterances. Friends, brothers and sisters, let's be patient. Let's be careful. Why are you commenting on other people's lives? To his master, he rises or falls. Why are you taking the sword of judgment in your hand? What's your concern? When you got saved, did God tell you that another person that also will get saved is to be attached to your apron? And then you must comment on every part of his life. Why don't you carry your own load and face where you are going? If Job is sick, if Job has fallen, if Job's children have died, if Job's body is all over with boils, and Job says he has not sinned, what's your concern in confirming that Job has sinned? Keep your mouth shut. If you want to get to heaven, face where you are going. The people that are running in athletics, in the relay race, they don't look up, down, sideways, right, left as they are running. They face where they are going. They don't even look at the people that are watching them and clapping. Because if they turn aside to look at people that are clapping or the people that are jesting, they will never make the race. Why are you looking sideways? Why are you looking at Job? Why are you looking at Samson? Why are you looking at Miriam? Why are you looking at Moses? Why are you looking at Aaron? Why are you looking at Peter? What's your concern? To his master, he rises or falls. You face where you are going. You see, if you face where you are going, your prayers will be answered quickly. Your journey will be faster. You will get to where you are going in time. But now you bring all these complications upon your life. You comment on this, you comment on that, you comment on that, you ruin yourself. And every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give account in the day of judgment. Don't sin with your mouth. You know what the Bible says about Job? After all the things came upon him. And the wife said, curse God and die. This is too much on you. Ah, he said, how are you talking like that? Can a man challenge God? Can we receive good from the hand of God and not receive evil? You talk like a foolish woman. You should encourage me in my trouble. Why do you talk like that? And then the Bible says, In all this, Job sinned not with his mouth. There was no spirit that pushed him. And that man suffered. You see, my brothers and sisters, when discipline comes, it is suffering. I know it. Our, our pastors know it. They know that discipline is hard. But you see, when we are disciplined, we forget that discipline is only in this life. So that we may be partakers of his holiness. So that the Lord will be able to do something and perfect us. You see, in this life, a lot of things will happen. We beat our children at home because we want them to become better in life. And our children in the church, all of you as who are here, you are our children. We have begotten you through the gospel. When discipline comes, it is not easy. When chastisement comes, it is not easy. Look at the case of Job. All children, they went just like that. All his property, everything went like that. Even the body, there was terrible thing on the body. And people pitied him. And yet, in all this, he sinned not with his mouth. What has happened to you that you are talking? Because somebody disciplined you? Did they kill you? Did they put boils on your body? Did they kill ten out of your children? Did they put boils on your body? Why can't you keep your tongue? Why can't you say, I know my Redeemer liveth? 
And even though he destroys this body with worms, I know I will see him face to face one day. I know none of these things move me. They don't move me. The chastisement, the discipline, the problem, I know it is for my good. I know that when he has tried me as gold, I will come forth refined. Why didn't you talk like that? Why? Because of little discipline? Because they said don't preach? Uh -uh. Preaching, they just told you to rest. Preaching is difficult. Because, you know, even if we allow you to be preaching and you preach error, you can go to hell just because of that. So if we relieve you and we say go and pray, you should understand and thank your God. Thank your God. But you see, because of little discipline, because of little restriction, then we spoil everything. We talk to this and talk to that and say, they hate me, they hate me. What if you discover later that they didn't hate you? How will you now correct all the complications of your utterances? How will you get to heaven? With the things you are saying with your tongue. The way to heaven, you are making heaven farther away from yourself, the way you are talking. You cannot be quiet. There are only 24 hours in the day. We sleep some of those hours. All the other hours we are awake. Why can't we put some beat in our tongue and say, I know the only thing that can quickly make me to go astray, to go astray is my tongue. When I wake up in the morning, I say, God, I know by your grace today, I'm not going to go to the prostitute's uh, hotel. I'm not going to go to all these other places. I know the quickest way that evil one can catch me is through the hook he can put in my tongue. I will watch my tongue. Why didn't you watch your tongue? You see, a lot of life has been lost because of the use of their tongue. In James chapter 3, Verse 1, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. And if any man offend not in word, the use of the tongue, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. You will never be holy, you will never be perfect without the control of your tongue. No matter what sanctification you claim, no matter how many days you fast, no matter what cleansing in the blood of Jesus you think you are receiving, you will never be perfect. You will never be perfect until you can bridle your tongue. In verse 26 of chapter 1, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, and but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Do you know Absalom? You remember his story? His tongue got him into a problem. Those words did not seem to be angry words. In fact, they were words that were just cool and normal. When somebody wanted to prostrate for him, he'll pick him up, he'll say, well, I'm not like that. Get up. I'm just like you. If somebody had been put there to deputize for the king, your case would have been looked into. But you don't have administration here. They're not going to put me there. They think that the pastor can do everything completely. And yet, if they have put me there, well, you know, the church, our church here, you know, 1,000 people, 2,000 people, they don't know they need people like me, but that's, what, that's where we are. That's what we're seeing. They think they can do it all alone. Another person comes and Absalom says again, where are you coming from? I'm coming from that local government area. Nobody in charge of local government area here. All they know is just preach, preach, and preach. They're not taking care of the people. And if they have put me there, they say that, well, all the work we are to do now is just lead us fellowship and do this. Nobody in charge of the people that have problems from local government area, if they have put me there, I would have done fantastically well. That's what Absalom said. But you know, that's what killed Absalom. He died miserably. He was riding on his horse. And the tree became the instrument of judgment upon him. The air that God had given him was hung on that tree. And Joab came and struck him through with arrows. You want to die like that? Why don't you keep your mouth and keep your heart? And say God should drive this evil spirit behind your tongue away from you. 
so that you will not die like that. Do you remember Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? They said, the land that you say you are taking us to, we have not got there yet. Will you pull out the eyes of the people? And you just make yourself a ruler over the people and you have an iron rule over the people? And Moses said, ah, you people, what are you saying? Come here. They said, we will not come. Do whatever you want to do. We are not going to come. You think that you can make us slaves like you made the other people slaves? So Moses went to God and said, God, show us whom you have appointed. Show us whom you have chosen. And then he told the people, he said, if these people die natural death, then that means that God has not sent Moses. And when Moses said that, the ground opened up and swallowed them alive. You want to die mysterious death by your tongue? Why are you not careful? Why don't you tell God, oh God, this my tongue is my problem. Why will you have to be confessing the sin of your tongue every day, every week? Why don't you bring it to the cross, get it crucified, and get it washed in the blood of the Lamb? And all that your tree that you have cut down, all the crops it has destroyed, go to the other people and clean up everything. Make it an assignment for one whole week and clean up everything and say, God, from now on that I've cleaned up all my slate, now put a bridle on my tongue. Control my tongue so that I will not continue in this way anymore. Remember I told you that the use of your tongue can make you eventually... To commit the unpardonable sin. In Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That's our prayer tonight. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. In times of impatience, in times of envy, in times of jealousy, in times of temptation, your tongue can run you into a problem farther than you realize. Tell the Lord, set a watch before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Don't comment about the lives of other people because you are not their Lord, you are not their master. Leave them with the Lord. Carry your own load. Your load is heavy enough. From tonight, make a commitment to the Lord that you will allow him to set a watch before your mouth to keep the door of your lips. Let's rise up and pray. Set a watch over my mouth. Don't allow your tongue to ruin you. Be clear. Be open to the Lord. Ask him to forgive. Ask him to cleanse. But we're willing to make right all the lives to have damaged by your tongue. Be willing to apologize. And be willing now to put your tongue under the Holy Spirit control. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you very much because of your love. Father, we are before you. We come up to you asking for your mercy. Pleading for your mercy. Just as we are. Father, cleanse us with your blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh God, we cannot even remember many damages we have done. Oh God, we cannot even remember many people we have destroyed. Only you know. So God will look up to you, pleading for your mercy, pleading for your love. Have mercy on us in Jesus' name. 
God, cleanse us. Cleanse us. And we present ourselves before you. We've been making promises. Saying we will never miss you this time. We have never been sincere. Asking you to deliver us. But Father, we are here this evening. Don't leave us alone. We cannot control this tongue on our home. We therefore pray, do something permanent. Do something permanent. You have taught us that we have the duty of committing our tongue into your hand day by day. We therefore pray that your spirit will control this tongue in Jesus' name. Father, when the enemy is pushing us to judge, to comment on other people's problems, we pray you will help us to say no in Jesus' name. We pray you will give us the courage to make necessary restitutions with what we have damaged our tongue with. Father, wisdom to correct our ways. Grant unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of our families have been destroyed. Many good relationships have been destroyed. Just because of this, our tongues. Where we need to make corrections, direct us. Give us the wisdom. Give us the courage. Amen. We commit our tongues into your hand. Day by day, control them. Amen. Once again, we pray for your blood. Cleanse us. Amen. Have mercy on us. Amen. We will rely on your grace. Amen. We rely on you. We do our own part. We know your grace is sufficient. If we can only rely on you, we promise you again. We give a promise again to allow your spirit to control us. We believe you have answered us. We thank you very much, Father. We still pray all you have prepared for us. Give them to us in Jesus' name. We are here, and we know by the time we shall go back, we know we are being at the month of transfiguration. Continue with us. Thank you for our leader. We praise you for your grace upon his life. Continue.